It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Hwasa. He is one of our newest next generation leaders. He is currently an assistant professor in psychiatry and neuroscience and physiology at New York University. Uh, his general area of research focuses on understanding the basic circuit mechanisms at a cellular level of how the brain filters sensory input that ultimately will be guide behavior. Michael holds an MD from the University of Jordan, a PhD in neuroscience from UPenn where he worked with Phil Hayden. And he studied the role of astrocytes and how they regulated sleep rhythm and brain state during that time. He completed a residency in psychiatry at Mass General Hospital and also went on to perform postdoctoral research at, with Matt, Matt Wilson at MIT. He started electrophysiological recordings at that time in the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is, he's still working on now. Uh, Michael has an impressive list of accomplishments already, uh, including recent impactful and high-profile publications. You're going to hear a little bit of that, that research today. In this past year, he was also the recipient of a prestigious Sloan Fellowship, um, the NIMH Brains Innovation Award, uh, an NRSAD Young Investigator Award, and his research has received grant support from multiple different foundations. Some of his most re recent work, which I expect we're going to hear more about today, um, has received a lot of popular attention as it provides insight into how the brain modulates attention, which has implications for mental health and disease states. And of interest, actually, to our president, Christoph Koch, is that Michael's work provides evidence for the role of the thalamic reticular nucleus, or TRN, as a switchboard of the brain. And this was actually hypothesized in the 80s by Christoph's dear friend, Francis Crick, who suggested that the TRN was acting as a garden, guardian of the thalamic gateway to the cortex. Uh, so today, he's going to talk to us about his recent research, in which he and his colleagues are uh, integrating targeted questions with technical solutions to help us advance our understanding of circuitry and brain function in the awake behaving mouse. So welcome, Michael. Well, thank you, Amy, for this kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been an amazing couple of days uh, being able to interact with everybody. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just a great time. I'm really excited about uh, being able to tell you about what we, what we do in my lab, but uh, before I do that, I would like to take a moment and uh, just uh, highlight the personal significance this uh, uh, invitation has for me. So uh, I was invited, uh, the, the invitation letter was signed by, by Christoph, and, and that was a pretty big deal. I kept talking about this uh, to everybody for, for weeks. Uh, I, I also talked to my son about that. My son is five, and he knows all about the thalamus because I keep talking about it. <clears throat> so hammering this into him, I'm going to go to the Allen Institute. I'm going to meet this guy who really, you know, along with, with Crick, inspired me to uh, study the brain in the first place. I mean, they, these guys uh, were rock stars. They made neuroscience so exciting to everybody. Consciousness, attention, what's the difference? You know, a lot of really interesting questions. So I'm telling my son all of that, and he's like, I hope they show you their time machine. I said, what are, you, what are you talking about, time machine? That, that, that doesn't make any sense, son. We kept b back and forth at it for about five minutes until I finally uh, cracked the code. I think he got confused. Uh, <laughs> I think he got confused. And I think what gave it away was the DeLorean because he was telling me, I hope they show you the time machine and the DeLorean. So, you know, so I, I, you, know, I, you can see, uh, well, I don't know about that, but, but definitely, definitely. So, so anyway, so I... <laughs> That, that, was the, that was the story. So, uh, so I'll get a little bit more serious, but I will maintain my Crick-centric theme uh, because it, it is true, it's a real thing that I was inspired to study what I'm studying now through the work of, of Francis Crick. And, and, and I'm going to tell you about that in the first part of the talk. And then I'm going to tell you how we discovered that Crick was actually right about uh, about a tw you know a 30 year old, uh, year old hypothesis about how attention works, and finally I'm going to tell you about unexpected ways in which uh, attention can be impaired and diseased uh, in a way that was inspired by some of the basic science that we're doing and some of the basic science that was that Francis Crick has uh, 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 actually uh, thought of. So my lab studies context dependent attention, how the brain augments relevant inputs and suppresses distraction as a function of behavioral context. What does that mean? Well, imagine you're driving and speaking on the cell phone at the same time to receive navigational instruction. Not, not that anybody does that, but just imagine that this happens. And moment to moment, you're allocating your attentional resources according to uh, uh, some, uh, some prior evidence. So, so let's say that the person who uh, is providing that uh, auditory information is reliable. You're going to be allocating more of your attentional resources toward audition. <clears throat> 
If that person is less reliable, you're going to be allocating less of your attentional resources towards audition. And you can do that dynamically. You can do that in a highly intentional manner. And it's one of the uh, essences of what being a human being is, is to allocate our attentional resources according to our behavioral needs. So how does this work? Well, we know from years of primate work that, that the prefrontal cortex, executive cortical circuits, can encode the behavioral context. context. And by interacting with, uh, with sensory regions in the brain, they can change the sensitivity of the brain to incoming sensory information. That's the model. It's a top-down model where the prefrontal cortex can interact with other sensory brain regions. Most of these models are, are cortical-cortical. Cortical, cortical where the prefrontal cortex can inter interact with sensory cortical regions. There's no doubt that at some level this is true, but what I'm hoping to convince you today is that at least some of these interactions can occur much earlier in the sensory stream at the level of the thalamus. The thalamus, by changing thalamic gain, by how sensitive the thalamus is, into, uh, is in to incoming sensory information, the brain can regulate the flow of its sensory input, and it does that by feed for inhibition, so the prefrontal cortex can modulate the activity of the thalamic reticular nucleus that Amy was just talking about, which is a shell of GABAergic neurons that surround the thalamus. So I was inspired to study that structure, the thalamic reticular nucleus, through work of Francis Crick. So in, in 1984, Francis Crick wrote this theoretical paper, uh, and in it basically he said, if the thalamus is the gateway to the cortex, the reticular complex might be described as the guardian of the gateway. Its exact function is unknown. So according to the field at the time, and, and according to what Crick was, was basically saying, is that the thalamus uh, is the gateway to the cortex. Everything that the cortex knows will have to come from the, thala uh, the uh, thalamic sources. And surrounding the thalamus is the shell of GABAergic neurons called the thalamic reticular nucleus, or the TRN. And because most studies of the TRN at the time were performed in brain slices or in anesthetized preparation, it showed that the neurons were very homogeneous. They did pretty much the same thing. So the idea of how this worked was like a pressure valve, where tightening the TRN reduces information flow, and loosening it allows information to flow. Now that idea is, is incompatible with the searchlight idea that, uh, uh, Crick, uh, that Crick had about independent control of sensory streams in a top-down manner, and is inc incompatible with the idea that the brain requires independent control over its sensory streams. So we had a problem, and what we figured, we, the way we could solve it is by interrogating TRN neurons in a, 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 a behaving preparation where we can tag individual neurons according to their thalamic targets. So we could look and say, this TRN neuron is projecting to a visual target versus an auditory target versus a limbic target. How do they behave under these uh, behavioral conditions? So to do that, we turned our attention to the mouse, which is genetically tractable, like we heard in the previous talk. And the mouse has everything that we have, uh, that we need, a thalamus, a cortex, and a TRN. The challenge in the mouse was to record from the TRN a deep and thin shell. So we developed these independently adjustable multi electrode arrays that were really, high, uh, really uh, lightweight. So it allowed us to precisely target our recording electrodes to in the fully behaving mouse. The advantage in the mouse is the ease by which we can tag individual neurons based on their connectivity and genetic identity. And we did that through uh, retrograde optogenetic tagging. What we found out later on was that we could train mice to do context-dependent attention tasks to regulate the flow of information in the mouse's brain in a very precise manner. We could train mice much like you would train a monkey to regulate exactly what type of information they are gating at any particular moment in time. But just by using these two first um, techniques, we were still able to show that the TRN is not a monolith and is composed of multiple independent subnetworks that could regulate information flow in a highly selective manner. And the way we did that is we took advantage of the fact that during sleep and wake, the brain has very different information processing needs. When we fall asleep, we suppress sensory input and we mostly focus on internally generated activity. And this is exactly what we saw two different uh, TRN subnetworks behaving. We tagged a visual subnetwork, a sensory subnetwork, and a limbic, memory associated subnetwork. And what we found that in sleep, the sensory subnetwork was high, highly active, suppressing 
thalamic sensory flow, the limbic memory associated subnetwork was a lot less active, presumably facilitating offline re memory related reactivation. When the this deep sleep or? This is deep sleep. This, this is deep sleep. This is non REM sleep. Uh, when the mouse woke up, this activity profile reversed. The sensory subnetwork became a lot less active, presumably facilitating sensory flow. The memory associated subnetwork became a lot more active, suppressing inappropriate memory reactivation during active exploration. So right there, we could show that the idea of a TRN monolith was incorrect, and the hardware that is required for a searchlight existed. OK, so this is all consistent with the idea that the TRN is composed of subnetworks defined by connectivity, and that their activity is matched to behavioral state. But the question is, does this architecture support the gain modulation required for context-dependent attention. I'm just going to re-articulate the problem. Driving while receiving uh, navigational instructions over the cell phone, the brain has to moment-to-moment -moment regulate the flow of sensory information according to prior uh, knowledge or according to ongoing behavioral needs. So we tried really hard to train mice to do this. It did not work. We're still trying. So we settled for something that was a lot simpler. So this is a cross-modal attentional task in which the mouse has to select between conflicting visual and auditory stimuli. And, and those occur in conflict. And the mouse has to incorporate a context cue that is uh, introduced trial by trial to cue it as to which of these uh, stimuli is the appropriate target. So the animal could get this cue, tell it to attend to vision, and it simply has to orient towards the light and to collect a reward. Uh, in, in, a, in, a completely different, in, a, in a completely different trial that is random, it gets the uh, auditory cue, it tells it to orient to the, or the auditory stimulus and collect the reward. So animals do that, do it very reliably. And uh, what we did is we tried to study the visual system in the context that vision was favored, selected, versus when it was suppressed. So we focused all our recordings on the visual system to ask, for the same sensory stimulus, when the brain cares about that, what does the activity in visual related circuits look like versus uh, when it's a distractor? OK, so the first thing that we asked is, do mice allocate attention the same way a primate would do? Is this task splitting attentional resources between vision and audition? And the answer is yes. The mouse is splitting its attentional resources. The way we know that is by looking at the sensitivity of the brain to visual information under the cross-modal condition that I just described and a visual-only condition where the mouse has to simply orient towards a visual stimulus without prior context. And what you see is that the detection threshold of the animal is higher under the cross-modal condition. So there's more visual input that is necessary to drive the behavior under the cross-modal condition compared to the visual-only condition, which is consistent with the idea that the mouse is actually, mouse is actually splitting its attentional resources. Now, is that because of a top-down prior expectation uh, 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 issue? Or is it because the mouse is simply distracted by the low-level sensory distractor? And it's the former answer, because when we uh, when we randomly but uh, 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 systematically remove the auditory distractor, this detection threshold is still higher. What that means is it's similar to when you're driving, speaking on the cell phone. The reason why the visual world is dimmer, it's not because somebody's actually speaking. It's because you're expecting them to speak. OK. So what about the, what about the circuitry underlying that behavior? So now we have a very robust behavior in a genetically tractable animal. We can go after some of the ideas of how this process works that has been in introduced by a lot of people in the primate field. So the idea, is, again, is that the prefrontal cortex can bias the sensitivity of the brain by interacting with sensory regions. Does the prefrontal cortex, is the prefrontal cortex involved in this particular task? So what we did is we inactivated the prefrontal cortex in a temporally precise manner using channel adoption in inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And what we found is that when we inhibit it in the anticipatory period, when the mouse gets the context cue, but just prior to when the target stimuli are presented, uh, the mice basically start guessing. They can no longer appropriately select between the auditory and visual input. When we present it just you know, a couple of hundred milliseconds after, after the stimuli have been presented, there is no effect. So this is consistent with the idea that the prefrontal cortex can encode context and can communicate that with sensory circuits to bias sensory processing. 
okay? Is that because it's interacting with the visual cortex. So we did the same experiment where we inactivated the visual cortex in a temporally precise manner. And what we found is that consistent with what we think the visual cortex is doing, it's enhancing visual processing. So the mice had a quantitative detriment in visual trials. Uh, there was no effect during stimulus anticipation. So this is not consistent with the idea that the PFC interacts with the visual cortex to change sensory gain and raises that possibility that it may be doing that at, a, at an earlier stage of sensory processing. And there, there are experiments that have been done in monkeys and humans to show attentional effects in the LGN. So we asked the same question in the LGN. We inactivated it using optogenetics. And what we found is that it had an effect both during stimulus anticipation and during stimulus presentation. So this is consistent with the idea that the PFC can bias sensory processing at the level of the thalamus, and then the thalamus changes its gain according to behavioral context. OK, if that's true, then we would expect to see changes in thalamic processing of visual input as a function of behavioral expectation. And one idea for how gain can be regulated in the thalamus is through feed-forward inhibition. So we genetically tagged the, the thalamic reticular nucleus, the visual thalamic reticular nucleus, so neurons in the thalamic reticular nucleus that projected to the LGN, and asked, do they show changes in activity that can tell the difference between behavioral context? During attention to vision, that brain presumably is augmenting visual uh, throughput, and during attention to audition, visual input is a distractor, so it's being suppressed. Do we see evidence for ch changes at the level of visual TRN that would be consistent with such a model? And we do. When the animal tends to vision, these neurons reduce their activity. When the animal tends to audition, they increase their activity. So this is consistent with the idea that they're regulating the gain of visual input as a function of behavioral context. And this is, this is an attribute that's consistent across the population. So this is a scatter plot where each dot is a visual TRN. So it's an optogenetically tagged visual TRN cell. And the x-axis is a firing rate modulation when the animal tends to vision. Y-axis is a firing rate modulation when the animal tends to audition. And you can see most cells are reduce their activity during visual trials, increase their activity during auditory trials. And that's where the mean of the distribution in the upper left uh, quadrant is this dependent on top-down control by the prefrontal cortex. So we did the same experiment while we inhibited the prefrontal cortex, and this sensory bias went away. So this is consistent with the idea that PFC can regulate thalamic inhibition, feed-forward thalamic inhibition, in a behaviorally appropriate manner. Does that change thalamic gain? So we, we, want, we wanted to ask that question by recording visual evoke responses in the LGN. So we, we targeted the LGN, and we changed the nature of the sensory stimulus from wall-mounted LEDs to head-mounted LEDs to more precisely control the visual input that the mouse gets on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. And this is what we found. This is an example of a single neuron when the animal tends to vision versus when it tends to audition. And you can see that there's a much more robust response to in the visual trials compared to the auditory trials. And I should just point out that the visual stimulus is identical in these two conditions. The only difference is what the animal actually internally cares about. So this is a direct demonstration of changes in sensory sensitivity as a function of behavioral expectation. OK, so changes in visual TRN firing rates, changes in LGN firing rates, are those mechanistically related? Is the reason why this happens, of, is, is that because of opposite changes in firing rate in the TRN? So we wanted to look at inhibition directly. We wanted to ask, is the LGN seeing different levels of inhibition according to behavioral context? And we know that when the TRN releases GABA onto uh, thalamocortical neurons and LGN neurons, they activate GABA-A receptors and cause an increase in intracellular chloride. So we, we, we thought, well, if we, if we look at chloride directly, then we will be able to know whether the LGN is seeing more or less chloride and therefore more or less inhibition. So we used this chloride indicator that was developed in George Augustine's lab. It's, it's, uh, it's called superchlamydian. We got the construct. We put it in AAV and injected it into the LGN. Uh, 
Uh, it's a, just to tell you a little bit about it, it's a, it's a fret-based indicator with a CFP donor and a YFP acceptor, and the YFP is particularly sensitive to uh, chloride, so when chloride goes up, or inhibition goes up, YFP, is uh, is YFP fluorescence is quenched, and uh, fret ratio is reduced. So just by reading out fret, we can tell, presumably, how much inhibition a structure is getting. So we used photometry, which is bulk measurement of chloride in the LGN, to ask uh, how that changes as a function of behavioral expectation. And the first question that we asked is, can we, can we observe sensory evoked inhibitory transients? And we can. So when we, when we stimulate the LGN, we, we, we can recruit the TRN and recruit inhibition. And that is actually reflected by, uh, by, by these very fast transients, these very drops in fret that are locked to the sensory stimulus. And these transients are completely, they're fast, so they're, they're on the order of 100 milliseconds. And uh, uh, they're completely eliminated by flumazenil, a GABA-A receptor antagonist. So, so we know we can observe inhibition at a fast, at, at a relatively rapid time scale in the freely behaving animal. Does the LGN see different levels of inhibition according to behavioral context? And it does. So this is in, 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 in the task. This is data from multiple animals. When the, when the animals attend to vision, you see a, a smaller inhibitory transients when the animal attends to audition. And there are changes in kinetics that I can talk about later. But if anybody's interested. But the, but the, but the point is that the LGN sees different levels of inhibition according to behavioral context. And that is completely, that differential inhibition is completely eliminated when we optogenetically inhibit the TRN. So this all is consistent with the idea that the TRN can work like a switchboard that is controlled by top-down input and that its neurons can change the gain of thalamic output in a modality-specific way. And this is the idea, basically. I'm highlighting the visual and auditory neurons, and I'm going to focus on the visual TRN. When the animal is cued to attend to vision, these neurons become a lot less active, increase the gain of visual, visual throughput. When the animal is uh, attending to sound and vision is a distractor, these, these uh, neurons become a lot more active, suppressing unwanted visual input. So, just to conclude this part, top-down bias of TRN subnetworks is a mechanism for attention. So I think, I hope that I've been able to convince you with that bit. And, and uh, w where this has now become uh, particularly exciting is in the idea of uh, uh, disruption of this process. So what I'm going to tell you about in, the, in a moment is the genetic disorders in humans where we, where, where, where we found that the gene in the mouse's brain the gene is conserved, conserved between mice and humans. When we look in the mouse's brain, the gene is uh, developmentally only expressed in the TRN. And the mouse has uh, ADHD, the, the human phenotype has ADHD. The mouse has ADHD-like uh, uh, phenotype that we can now dissect at a very high degree of precision. So this is the, 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 the gene, it's called patch D1. Uh, it's, uh, it's deleted in, in, in humans, and it can lead to a variety of symptoms, including ADHD, autism spectrum, and intellectual disability. It's an X-linked disease, and that's why all these kids are uh, boys. Um, we, this is a collaboration with Guaping Feng, uh, and, and, the Fe and, and, and Guaping thought it would be interesting uh, to collaborate on it because when, we, when they looked in the mouse's brain, they found that the patch D1 gene was enriched in the TRN. It was exclusively expressed in the TRN during development, continues to be expressed uh, in the TRN throughout life, and is important for TRN functional development. The neurons become hypoactive in a patch D1 knockout. The patch D1 knockout mouse has impaired thalamic inhibition, and we checked uh, through photometry, uh, inhibitory photometry. Deletion of patch D1 in mice causes a host of disease-related phenotypes. But what, where, where things got exciting is that we can precisely map the distractibility and hyperactivity that is found in the mouse to TRN deficits by selectively knocking out this gene in the TRN. And by using insights from sly selective physiology, why, to understand why the uh, TRN neurons are hyperactive, you could develop uh, novel ways to reverse these ADHD symptoms in the mouse. So this is all sort of making us think of the idea that, in, at least in a subset of human diseases, uh, the patch D1 is not, is, not, uh, is, not, is not a lone case. Uh, there are many, many gene-related diseases that are actually localized to the TRN early and developed. And, and that's, that's actually 
thanks to the Allen Institute, we can actually see that now. Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at that now, and we're looking at, we were exploring the idea of a leaky thalamus being, in, we, being at the center of certain diseases. So the idea is very simple. When the TRN is intact, thalamic inhibition is intact, most of the thalamus is inhibited except for what we actually care about. When the TRN is perturbed, thalamic inhibition is perturbed, irrelevant inputs become much more distracting. So just to conclude this part, impaired TRN function can contribute to ADHD symptoms in humans, opening a new venue for exploring diagnostics and therapeutics. And I should just um, end by acknowledging the people who contributed to this work. So everything that I showed you uh, it was, was, was done by uh, Ralph Wimmer, Ian Schmidt, and Miho Nakajima, three very talented postdocs in the lab. Uh, Carl Dice, uh, collaborators, Carl Dyseroth collaborated with us on the photometry, and Guo Pingfeng collaborated on the Patch D1 project and, and uh, funding. Thank you. So that was great. We have some time for questions, and microphones will come to you. It's on? Yeah. Thanks. Cool stuff. So I have two questions. Well, I have many questions, but I just restricted to two. So A, what are the anatomical <coughs> pathways between prefrontal cortex and LGN? I don't know of any direct one. There is none. Uh, so it's a functional interaction, and we're looking into how they're going to be connected. And there's a variety of ways that we're, we're, we're exploring that question, but it's an active, it's an active uh, area that we're looking at. And the, uh, the second one is, uh, so Francis, uh, Francis Crick, that has had... Um, you know, he had this idea about the spatial uh, searchlight, and I understand you don't do space, but, but the, um, one of the key ideas was you that the NIT hyperpolarizes the relay cells and thereby triggers the, the burst uh, and the bursting behavior, right? Do you, do you have any evidence for enhanced bursting behavior? No, I highlighted the areas where my stuff agrees with Francis Crick, but uh, I, uh, I just don't think that's, uh, that idea is correct. I mean, you know. But, but that's, that's right. okay. Now, yeah. <laughs> I think everything else is great, but, but that, that, there's no evidence for that. I mean, you know, this idea that bursting is a wake-up call to the cortex, I, I just don't believe that. I mean, I think uh, there's plenty of evidence that uh, bursts occur naturally, and, you know, the statistics of, of natural images can evoke bursting in the LGN uh, just by a push-pull relationship, and Judith Hirsch has shown that. Uh, very convincingly. It's not a sleep thing. It's not an attention thing. It's just a natural attribute of how the thalamus is wired. Hey. Is this on? Okay. Um, I was wondering if you thought this pathway is as, is as important for multimodal forms of attention versus unimodal forms of attention. <coughs> um, no, it's a great question, and we're exploring that in, in the auditory domain to, um, you know, um, ask about more of you know feature-based attention. Does the thalam is the thalamus deployed for you know paying attention, let's say in the visual system, to this orientation versus that orientation? And it's a great question. I think the topography is so. What you would need for that is some topography where there's some organized uh, anatomy that would support uh, feature-based extraction, and it does exist. So whether the animal uses it for that, I don't know. But those are the kind of questions that we're very interested in. I was going to ask about <clears throat> spatially focused attention, like, you know, in the visual system, in a Where's Waldo task, as you look through that picture of the hundreds of people at the Allen Institute looking for somebody in particular, do you think there are little modules within the TRN that are um, turning off? It's a great question. I think, um, so Bob Wartz had a paper in 08, or, yeah, 08, I think, uh, that was uh, looking at attentional effects in the TRN and LGN, and they were spatial. So looking at two cells, uh, you know, that, uh, a si single cell that, you know, where, when you cue the animal spatially to attend to a particular location, you get, you know, less uh, TRN spikes uh, and more LGN spikes towards the attended location, but if you attend out, then you get the opposite effect. So, so I think that there is evidence that there's attentional modulation in the TRN that is spatial, whether that supports uh, sort of feature-based extraction at the level of thalamus, I don't know. I, I don't know if that is your question or not. That's sort of the question, but it's hard to imagine that the prefrontal cortex is doing this. Doing what? Doing the spatial-based attention. I think there's plenty of evidence that the prefrontal cortex is doing spatial attention. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Uh, I was curious, uh, what is the uh, level of um, resolution of spatial attention? And if we are thinking that uh, this type of mechanism might be placed when there is a much wider uh, discrepancy, for example, like uh, space between very uh, far away distances or uh, multimodal attention, because there is, at least in monkeys, for quite a long literature from Bob Desimond's work and yeah. uh, quite a few others, which are seeing the fact that as, at least for things which are very close by, the effects of attention are minimal, even at the level of inputs to V1, and they become much larger further downstream. You mean, you mean v, the V4 effect that... Yes, that, that go, go, going Bob up. This going yeah, up yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the fact that the V1 and V2 inputs to V4 do not show the uh, attentional effects um, uh, or show much, much less attentional effects than V4 uh, or IT. No, no, it's a great question. I mean, you know, this is a, this is a discussion. I don't know where uh, Yartsev is, but what we were talking about that earlier today, you know, that a lot of these tasks are contrived, right? I mean, it's got to be a task dependent. Uh, uh, th there are going to be a lot of task-dependent effects that depend on how you cue the animal, you know, is the PFC involved, is the PFC not involved? So the, the mechanics of the task are going to influence what kinds of attentional effects you're going to see. So I don't, I'm not surprised that there are going to be attentional modulation V4 under certain conditions, less so in, um, in the thalamus or V1. But I think the task that we were developing was to precisely look at thalamic gain. I mean, it is, on some level, a contrived situation just to ask this very particular question. Can the brain do that under a particular condition? Uh, thanks. Can you say a few more words about the precise overlap between the phenotypes of the patch D1 mouse and human and your model? They uh, intersect, but... Could, could you say that again? I, I didn't catch the question. Can you say a little more about the precise overlap between the observed phenotypes yeah, in yeah. the patch T1 mouse and human versus all of the elements of your model? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, um, the, the kids, the humans, have uh, ADHD in about, uh, I forget the exact figure, but it's a substantial proportion of, 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 of boys that... Some of, them, some of them have severe intellectual disability. Correct. Some of them have very severe intellectual disability. Some of them don't. It's a, it's a copy number variant, so it's a deletion of that that correlates with uh, it has a very high penetrance in sort of intellectual disability all the way to some milder forms of intellectual disability, but definitely ADHD. And we do, I didn't show the data, and I'm happy to show you, you know, offline. Uh, I just didn't have time. But the mice are distractible. We can, we can show that. Uh, and we can show that this is a, a, a result of a TRN-specific knockout of the gene, and it's rescued by... Uh, uh, a particular drug that rescues the cellular phenotype that we see in the slice. So that's, th that's how much I know about Could I? Um, I enjoyed our, uh, back here, I enjoyed our uh, discussion oh. at the break, Clay, back here. Yeah. Um, and uh, we discussed at the break that uh, sensory versus executive ADHD. And given that the TRN is such a large structure, and extends up towards, you know, motor thalamus and pr presumably beyond. Have you thought, you know, going back to the very first talk, Christoph's movie, <laughs> you know, if an animal is engaged in, in a task that requires focus and sequencing, do you, you, have you thought of experiments like that? Um, you know, you, you mean sort of motor TRN? Motor TRN, mo mo motor and, thalamus and, related, yeah, um, and, and ex executive function sequencing, yeah. things like that, because that that would bring it more, perhaps more closely to clinical conditions. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a great point. I mean, I've thought about it. Um, I haven't really made any tangible sort of progress beyond thinking about it, because you know, there's 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, and there's there's you know limited uh, stuff. Uh, so. Um, no, but it's, 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 so I can tell you something that hinges, maybe not directly on, on sequencing, but on motor output. So the mice, I've always wondered why is it that kids with ADHD were hyperactive and distractible? Why are these two attributes traveling together? And it's, it's unclear. Um, in these mice, we're not only able to rescue distractibility, we're also able to rescue hyperactivity by targeting the TRN. So, one idea is that 
the distractibility is the flip coin of hyperactivity, at, at least in that particular condition. It's sort of a thalamic release sign. How true that is, I don't know, but this is the kind of thing that we're, we're going after. It's not as precise as looking at sequences or you know, skilled motor behavior, but it's, it's one measure of motor output. So you, you showed quite nicely that uh, on average the visual TRN neurons were uh, more active in the auditory task than the visual task, and you also showed us that the, uh, that the visual gain was modified. But it was also pretty clear from the data that there was a bit of diversity from neuron to neuron as to how modulated it was, and presumably there was also diversity in, in how much of effect of gain they had. Are, are those two correlated, or? We haven't looked. It's a great question. We haven't looked. It's, I haven't thought about it until you asked the question, so I'll go back and look. Is it, I guess. Hi. Uh, you briefly touched on uh, burst versus tonic firing in the LGN. Um, I was wondering, with your in vivo recording, did you observe burst firing in the TRN during your awake recordings? Uh, do you see any um, separation between the physiological outcomes of burst versus tonic firing? We, we, have, we haven't observed firing, uh, burst firing in the task. Do you um, think that's because it's required during uh, sleep alone? or? I think that the... So... I don't know. I have to really think about that. Um, I, I think, you know, where did people find bursts, in the LGN at least, and in, in when, when, you know, when animals viewed natural movies because of, you know, changes in contrast, hyperpolarization followed by depolarization, and those changes in, in sensory input uh, 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 basically generate bursts. Um, we, the task just doesn't have that. Uh, our task doesn't have that. So it's not really clear. Uh, uh, whether we, we are in a position that maximizes the probability that we would observe them. So the short answer is we didn't really observe a lot of bursts. Uh, uh, there were just, yeah, that, yeah. Thanks. Um, going back uh, to some old literature on uh, PGO waves, which are uh, orientation or eye movement uh, initiated signals uh, during REM sleep, which are also occur during waking, is the idea is that it's a cholinergic system that uh, when you orient towards something, um, activates a pathway through the visual system. And um, acetylcholine, as you know, has a very strong inhibitory effect on TRN neurons. Uh, I don't know about that, but, but I know your paper. I, I know. Well, I, I, I can know tell history, you for sure. I, I, it has sure a very that. strong inhibitory effect, but it has a strong excitatory through nicotinic and then a longer lasting inhibitory yeah, yeah. effect. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, so uh, this was, Wolf Singer did this before me, you know, with stimulation and Ray Dingledine did it also. Um, so the idea is that uh, when the animal is orienting towards something, you would have a burst of maybe a, a brief nicotinic excitation and a long muscarinic uh, inhibition of TRN neurons. And it could be very specific to a particular part of the TRN, according to, I wonder if that could yeah. be somehow the prefrontal cortex it could, it could, it could feeding be down very well to be, that yeah. orientation system that is helping you with the tension. It, it could very well be. So the, I mean, that is something that we're actually pursuing in a hypothesis-driven manner. Is it the cholinergic system in the basal forebrain or in the brainstem? Uh, because both get prefrontal input, both project to the TRN. Well, at least the basal forebrain one projects to the TRN. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know yet, but, but we're looking at that. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions, I think, and then we're going to move on to our final team talk for the morning. So let's go with a couple more that we have microphones out for. Is it working? No. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> can you please, this was a very cool talk, but can you please also comment on <clears throat> sorry, um, the duration of training, how long it takes to train the animals on this task? And just yeah. hypothesize on what do you think might potentially be the influence of this training on the responses that you see? Um, I mean, you have to train the mice to do this, um, you know, and it takes a long time. Um, six, no, 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 six weeks, six weeks. I mean, you know, the thing is, they get the association in a step-by-step -step manner. You know, first is orient to the light, orient to the sound. That's pretty quick. You know, in a week, animals can generally get that. I think the more difficult association for mice 
to make is the context cue, that that particular context is, uh, is relevant to this particular sensory selection. And that, you know, the way we do it is we do it in a block design first, you know, where the animal has to do 10 to 20 visual trials initially, and then we start shrinking the, uh, you know, reducing the number of trials and the switches, but, and increasing the number of switches in a particular session, and that takes a long time. Uh, I don't know if the training is a reflection of the mice not doing that normally or naturally, but again, this was a behavior that was designed like you would design an opt I mean, I think about behavior like I think about optogenetics. I think about it as a way to make the mouse or a circuit do exactly what you want it to do. Can it do it? Can it be, can it be implemented in a particular you know, computation the way you think it works or not? And these are, you know, you can just test that hypothesis using behavior, so. Yeah, just a la um, um, an um, another anatomy question. Now, the basal forebrain also, of course, projects to the interlaminar nuclei, and they, on their way to cortex, also make local synapses in the in the NRT. Do you know anything about that circuit in involvement yeah. in? Yeah. Uh, so, so to be clear, the and, and this is something that I might not have been very clear. I am only talking about the NRT that is visual, that is defined by its projection to the uh, the LGN. So that doesn't get interlaminal input. The part of the TRN that gets interlaminal input is the part that projects to the, the interlaminal nucleus. And that's a little bit more anterior, a little bit more ventral. OK, well, that's great. Let's all give Mike full. Uh, thanks. Applause. Thanks. <laughs>